and welcome to the April 28th, 2015 school committee meeting. This meeting is re being recorded by East Hampton Public Access Cable and the school committee would like to recognize and thank Tim Riley for taping tonight's production. East Hampton Public Access Cable Station channels 5, 19, and 20 is looking for volunteers. If anyone's interested in helping to tape city government meetings, please contact Kathy Lynch at 413-203-1360. Superintendent Fallensby, do you have some announcements? I for have us? a few announcements, yes. The next school committee meetings are May 12th and June 9th and 23rd, 2015. Meetings will begin at 6 30 p.m. The Special Education Parent Advisory Council will meet on the following dates in the conference room on the second floor at 50 Payson Avenue. May 13th and June 10th. There's a half day of school on Friday, May 1st, due to Teacher Pro Professional Development Day. There is no school on Monday, May 25th, due to Memorial Day. And at this time, the last day of school is scheduled for Wednesday, June 24th. And I think that's a go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have any correspondence? We do not have any correspondence. Okay. And do we have any gifts? We do not have any gifts to report this. All time. right. Okay, at this time on our agenda, we would <laughs> like to invite anyone who might like to speak to the committee um, to do so at this time, public speak time. And we typically ask for people to come to the podium if they'd like to speak. And this time I believe we have a committee member who would like to do so, but will remain seated. Thank you. Um, I just want to speak briefly and, and I hope clearly in regards to a pressing issue that I'm pleased to see the, um, I want to make sure I have my paperwork correctly laid out here in front of me. The, the state auditor and other elected officials have been addressing, and I speak from the perspective of my experience over the, the better part of the last decade as a member of the school committee, um, and uh, longer than that as a parent of children in the school system. I'm a graduate of the public schools myself, um, and currently an, as a member of the committee, I'm a servant of the East Hampton Public Schools, and I want to ask a basic question um, about charter schooling. And before I do that, I want to say that I know lots of folks who enjoy the benefits of a great education in the charter schools. I have colleagues and, and people that I know around town, and um, these are designed to be tough questions. They're not meant to be personal questions, um, but I hope they resonate with people. And the, and the basic question that I ask is whether or not charter schools truly serve the public good. And if I can borrow from State Auditor Bump's final remarks, um, the debate is about how to ensure that all children have access to effective learning environments which both instruct and enrich them in our communities. It's also about whether charter schools advance or detract from those efforts. So the questions I would ask um, of charter schools is, and, and in this case it, I'm asking about the charter schools for students in our community. I know we've seen things published about charter schools nationally. I know we've seen things about charter schools in Boston. Um, that's terrific nationally. It's relevant in Boston. I'm asking questions about the charter schools that exist in the Pioneer Valley and the impact that they have here. First, do they serve students who would otherwise be underserved by their local public schools? And what is the measure of that relative performance? Second, do they serve proportionally the same demographic as the local public schools and what evidence of their success with meeting the unfunded mandates of services, particularly for special needs students? Third, do they operate on a financial model that can be replicated by the local public schools? What legacy costs do they bear for people and facilities who have served their communities for generations? What impact does a family have when the cost of educating their child in a charter school is greater than the amount that they pay to the community in property taxes. Do charter schools offer innovations that local public schools can adopt so that all children benefit? What evidence is there of the professional development outreach services provided by the local charter schools? Do they strengthen the fabric of our community? What evidence is there that participation in charter schools deepens and enriches the connections families feel for East Hampton? In short, do the charter schools in the Pioneer Valley serve the twin purposes of providing superior educational opportunity for children and help to reform the existing public school system so that it can offer similar educational quality for all? Or do they operate as de facto private schools at the public expense without evidence that that clearly serves the common good? 
I hope at some point that the, the school committee can follow up on the, the good work here. I know Superintendent Follinsby shared this with us earlier. This is actually um, a report that came from the state auditor back in December. Um, but it asks a lot of questions um, that go along with these that I think um, should be fully investigated so that we can have a, a constructive conversation about the impact of charter schooling on educational excellence in the Pioneer Valley. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Anyone else have anything to share? Okay, um, we'll move on to our finance subcommittee report. Uh, we'll be meeting uh, next Tuesday, May 5th, from 5 to 6. 5 to 6, okay. And the policy subcommittee? Nothing to report. Okay. CES, do we have an update? We don't. Our next meeting <coughs> is May 27th, I believe. May 27th. Okay. Then we'll move right on to Mr. Brian Atwater for a student activities update. Thank you, Ms. Lucinia. Um, most are coming up next uh, on May 2nd is the annual community cleanup day. It will be sponsored this year by the EHS Key Club and the National Honor Society in order to clean up the downtown area of East Hampton and the parks within our town. Um, that follow Brian, that? did you say that was May 2nd? May 2nd, yes, this Saturday. Um, AP exams shall be the next two weeks for sophomores, juniors, and seniors in AP classes. Um, the next two weeks ranging from the 4th through the 15th. Um, depending on which class or exam you plan to take, uh, students can check online or with their teachers. Uh, May 9th is the EHS prom at the log cabin starting at 7 p.m. Sure. <laughs> uh, the community barbecue will take place on May 22nd at the East Hampton High School where the student council will recognize uh, members of the community that make EHS functions and donations possible. Senior finals and the last day of school for seniors will be May 28th and 29th and graduation will follow on June 6th at 7 p.m. at EHS. And as stated by Ms. Collinsby, the last day of school for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors will take place on June 24th. Can, can I ask a quick question about the last day of school? Is that a half day? Uh, the last day of school, June 24th, for is students. a half day. A half day for students. Thank you. And finals take place the two days prior. So, um, news for the school committee. Uh, present the next meeting will be the next student representative. Um, elections for the student council are will be taking place in the next few weeks. And the new student council president will be in the audience at our next meeting on May 12th. And as a result, May 12th will be my last meeting no, on the bench. <laughs> Do you want to just put, so. put off college and just run one more year? <laughs> Uh, no, I could, no. Run, I could run for school committee. I mean, I would there have to go. go up against one of you guys, which I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing. <laughs> but wow. I've enjoyed my time up here, and I have to say that I've grown a lot as a result of it. Um, and I'd really like to thank you guys for wow. helping shape my senior year. You, you really you. set an inspiration. You've really yes. set a phenomenal example. Yeah, I agree. Yes. I mean, you've been a wonderful st student representative for us. It's been my Shop pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said to him. He looks so nice. To him. <laughs> it's always look nice. But. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Okay, Superintendent Ballinsby. Yes, I have two items on my report tonight. The first is a budget update, followed by an update on the park assessment that uh, we've been taking and will continue to take. So first, uh, Andy Paquette, our uh, business management consultant, will give us an update on the uh, budget. I included in your packets an update as of the 22nd of April uh, with projections to year end. Um, you can see uh, how tight it is uh, when you look at where we stand and our funding sources available to us. Uh, so we're, we're looking at as of right now with all things going according to plan. I mean we have two months left so I'd like to think that we're we're okay but I don't want to jinx ourselves if yes, that's right. Um, 
So we're we're looking at a projected balance of uh, twenty three thousand two hundred ninety three dollars to the good uh, from all sun funds. Uh, we had submitted our uh, circuit breaker extraordinary relief reimbursement. We've gotten verbal notification that we did not qualify. Um, we're waiting on uh, the actual letter and hopefully some information as to how that was, which you would think uh, regarding the increase in expenses that we, were, we incurred, uh, how it didn't get us over the threshold. So they said that they will submit that to us in an explanation uh, once we get that letter. So uh, that's bad news, but you know, we, as you say, this uh, projection for year to date uh, was not anticipating us getting that. That would have only only helped us. So that's where we stand with that. Um, Superintendent Follinsby mentioned about uh, wanting an update regarding food service. I understand Mr. Stratton will be coming to give a little more in-depth detail regarding it, but we are trending slightly less favorably than we would like. We are projecting a $24,000 uh, I'll say shortfall investment in uh, the program and uh, the investment as of right now I'll use a word I actually like that is about 27 grand uh, what we're looking at participation for some reason is down uh, both in breakfast and lunch so um, but that's what we're looking at right now is a, a projected operating uh, investment of 27 grand in a food service. Can I ask a question about that? If you have students who are who qualify and are enrolled for free or reduced lunch and let's say hypothetically those students don't currently participate, may, maybe they bring lunch from home or whatever, excuse me, um, if they were to begin buying lunch or get it, does that improve that? Or does yes. that oh okay, okay because we're reimbursed. That's correct. I okay. Mean, and the meals. Okay. Any questions on either the local budget or food service or anything else? And Andy, you might speak a little bit about um, the work that we were doing in the leadership team today. Sure. Uh, as far as with the information we have regarding the FY16 budget and where things stand, and we'll talk more in detail with the finance subcommittee on Tuesday, but we are going through to come up with uh, options for uh, reductions needed based on the information that we have of the city appropriation and uh, the fact that April 1 the move-in date as we call it uh, regarding special education tuition so we have that number as firm as possible uh, so we've been going through and looking where we are regarding the gap and how to address that gap um, we're looking at now a gap of about three hundred forty thousand uh, dollars in that is also ever-changing. We still don't know about grant information. Um, we've already factored in things that we know about, about retirements. Those are already factored in. And other things regarding trends and spending from some of the energy-efficient upgrades that we've made citywide that has helped the schools. We've already reflected those as well. One of the big things that we've done, which is uh, and even though we didn't get circuit breaker extraordinary relief in the budget deliberations we were sort of advised by desi to uh, do a 60 percent reimbursement for circuit breaker for next year based on ways and means that has been back up to level funding amounts for this year uh, so we we re up that to gained us about 180 grand uh, for up to 70 percent reimbursement so that was, I'd say, the good news on that front. So that's where we stand now for FY16. After you made the adjustment or the projected adjustment for the circuit breaker for next year, we still are at the 300,000. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Andy, another, uh, on, on a plus note, um, maybe you could repeat what you shared at leadership team uh, about utility costs uh, oh, with the high school. Yes. Uh, and if he's watching, he's going to probably like this. But the previous mayor, when uh, we were talking about the energy efficient uh, upgrades that were done with the new high school, uh, I'll had a, I had a healthy amount of skepticism that adding 60,000 square feet to the building and would have very little, if any, uh, impact on the utilities and heating. Uh, I've, I was anticipating that we would see some uptick in that, uh, and we haven't. So... You know, he was right. We'll say that. I'm sorry, he was not. Yes, I'll say. Yeah, the previous mayor was correct. <laughs> uh, so, 
uh, we are seeing and it's not all kidding aside it's not only just for the high school uh, the city has done a, a significant investment in energy efficient upgrades that the school has benefited from with the green communities that we're doing this year now uh, we are seeing a return on that investment both you know in the future we'll see it but also in previous uh, programs and projects that have been done Any, any questions for Andy? Okay. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. <coughs> uh, and the next report is uh, an update on the park assessment uh, about what's been going on in our district. So I'm just going to move over to the podium, and I have a little PowerPoint, um, and I have um, given each of you a copy of it. <coughs> Apologize for the small print; it came out much smaller than I thought it was going to. And I also have invited um, uh, Ms. Belize from Whitebrook Middle School and Ms. Napolitano from Center and Pepin Elementary Schools. They are currently in the process of, uh, well, they've given one assessment already and will uh, be so uh, soon be giving another assessment. And so I've asked them to come and uh, share some of their experience <coughs> with you as well. So first, um, a little bit of history uh, about the park assessment. Park does stand for Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. And why park in 2015? So why should a district elect to administer park instead of MCAS in the spring of 2015? That was a question we all had to ask ourselves last year when we were making this decision. We had to make it by October of this year and we did choose to uh, give the park assessment. So why? What are some of the reasons? Students participating in park will have a head start on experiencing a next generation assessment, the type of assessment that all schools will likely be required to administer in the next school year. Uh, my understanding is that the board has still not taken a vote on um, the park assessment, but uh, that will be happening soon, and all indicators are that uh, we will be uh, using the park assessment next year. Districts that uh, choose to administer park in 2015 will be able to do so at, a, uh, at no risk. They will have their 2015 accountability levels held harmless. So accountability levels are the level that the state gives you based on the results of your assessments. Um, and so uh, there's no risk to taking park this year. You can go up in your accountability level. You can go to a higher level, but you can't go lower. And there will be a few more slides to um, uh, give more information on that. So what does PARC look like? What's happening in our, our district right now and in our schools? There is a computer-based or paper and pencil-based um, uh, method of taking this assessment. We debated about doing the computer-based assessment because we thought that it would be good for our students to experience that. But then as we began to think about what was involved in changing from the MCAS assessment to the PARC assessment for our teachers in particular and our administrators and trying to ensure that we had all of the computer capability that we needed and that we would be able to do it without any glitches, it began to seem like more than we wanted to take on this year. Um, we've done a lot to get ready for a computer-based assessment, should that be the requirement next year. And we feel confident that if we were to, um, to have this assessment next year, that we would be able to do computer-based. Our technology director, Ashley Barstow, has done a, an amazing job of uh, building um, computer labs at the, the middle school and at our elementary schools and uh, really getting, helping to get us ready. So um, PARC also, uh, in terms of understanding, it has two parts in English language arts. Uh, the performance-based assessment, or commonly called the PBA, and the end-of-year assessment called the EOY. There are also two parts in math, again, a performance-based assessment and an end-of-year assessment. The first part, the performance-based assessment, focuses on writing and analytical skills, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. 
The second part, the end of year, targets reading and math skills. The two parts are designed to combine uh, access to, to a, combine to assess knowledge and skills and our ability to think critically, our students' ability to think critically. So here's a chart that shows a little bit more about the two parts. I don't know that it's uh, that easy to see on the uh, PowerPoint on the overhead, but you have a copy of it in your packet. So part one, again, is the performance-based assessment. Uh, it happens in late March and early April. Uh, the writing, uh, it's about writing effectively, and it's about analyzing text. It's in, in, math, in English language arts and mathematics. It's about solving multi-step problems and using abstract reasoning. In math, they are, um, students are also asked to um, substantiate their answers. The second part is the end of year assessment, um, and this is computer scored uh, at Pearson. Uh, it's a reading comprehension in English language arts, and it occurs in May, and it's also an understanding of major grade level concepts uh, in math uh, for the end of year assessment. So does it count? That's been a big question about this year. Last year, we participated in uh, a, a park field test. And we were given by the state the grades that we needed to uh, do the field test in. And we performed the field test. We got no results from that field test. It's actually a two-year pilot that's happening for the park assessment. Last year was the first year of the pilot. This year is the second year where districts were asked to if they wanted to participate in, in park. So it was a volunteer um, participation. For the 2015 test, park results will be official. That means that students will receive performance results. Parents and teachers will receive performance results. Um, an another piece to keep in mind is that grade 10 will not take PARC because MCAS is still required for graduation and will be for a few years to come. MCAS science and MCAS alternative assessments, the MCAS alt, will continue as is for all grades at this point in time. And the other piece is that the, there was a ninth and 11th grade optional park tests, and our high school chose to uh, not take the uh, ninth and 11th grade park test because that would have been uh, a lot more testing than is currently going on now. So hold harmless. You'll hear the, these two words uh, in connection with the park assessment. Districts that chose to administer park in the spring of 2015, right now, uh, as I said earlier, will have their accountability levels held harmless. And this means that a district's accountability level can only improve or remain the same. It cannot decline from its 2014 level. For this reason, we believe that it was important for us here in East Hampton to have an experience with this assessment before it was uh, an assessment that would count for us or against us in terms of our accountability levels. It was important for our administrators to have an experience with this, our students and our uh, teachers as well. And um, my two building administrators will talk more about that in a few minutes. Here's uh, a little example from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education about Hold Harmless. Um, what will ho Hold Harmless look like in practice? Here are three examples. So School A, you can see in the third uh, white column, is currently a level one. With uh, the park assessment, they became a level two, declined. But their accountability level will still remain level one so it won't count against them. School B is currently level two. They dropped to level three, declined uh, after taking park, but they will remain a level two accountability level. And school three was a level three. They uh, went to a level two after taking park, and so now their accountability level will be that higher level, the level two. And I'm going to turn the um, program over now to uh, Ms. Napolitano, our elementary principal, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the actual experience that they've had and what the schedule is for the remainder of the year. Good evening. So this is a um, 
And over, well, this is the schedule for Elementary Park. This was the same schedule for both Center Pepin and Maple. <coughs> um, we had one date that was different, but essentially it's the, the same schedule. And there are many sessions in park as compared to MCAS, and I'll compare the two in just a, in a moment. Um, as you can see, the, the timing of it ranges from about 60 minutes to 90 minutes um, for a test session. Um, the reason why there's a buffer, there's a buffer of 25 minutes in there for handing out test booklets, giving instructions, those sorts of things. So the testing time that students were involved in the testing was from about 9.15 every morning to about 10.55. But the actual testing time is in parentheses there for each of those sessions. Um, so you can see how much time it took out of our, our day. Um, I will say that although, um, and I'll show this in the next slide, but MCAS is untimed. Because this was timed, it felt like it was less time. And that's just a feeling by students and teachers. It's not the actually the amount of minutes that were counted up, but it felt like it was less time. It felt like it took up less of our day and our week because it was timed. Um, so I'll go on to the next slide here where I did a comparison of, of MCAS and PARC for both third grade and fourth grade, which is obviously what the elementary um, um, students take. So in MCAS, there's four test sessions total, um, two for ELA, two for math. They are untimed. Our schedule, we scheduled them for about two hour blocks. but. Um, so the total amount of minutes that was scheduled was 480 minutes, but many, many students took much longer than that time because it is an untimed test. We would have whole classrooms that would take an extra half hour, hour in some cases, um, for MCAS. Um, if you compare that to the park, there are eight sessions, um, but they are timed, 60, between 60 and 75 minutes. Our schedule was um, roughly the same, a little bit less per day. The total number of minutes scheduled was 785 minutes. However, they did not take, students did not need the total amount of time to take the test by and large. Even um, our special education students that are allowed extra time did not require the same amount, the entire amount of time. What remains to be seen is whether or not that's a good thing. <laughs> um, we don't know if the students did well and were able to sort of, you know, know what was on the test and just were able to do it, um, or whether they breezed through it. But we won't know that until we have the results. Um, if you look at the grade four, this is where the more significant amount of time was spent on MCAS because of that long composition, um, which is in fourth grade and not in third grade. Um, it's the five set test sessions total, the fifth one being that long comp. Um, there were um, many students, again, took longer for the regular ELA and for the math, but there we had a, a significant number of fourth grade students that took the entire day to do the long comp. So they started in the morning, they did their rough draft. Um, the way that the long comp is broken up is you do a rough draft, you take a break, and then you come back and do your, your final draft. They took most of the morning to do a rough draft. They had lunch, but they had to eat at a special table where there was no talking about the test, and then they went back and finished it up in the afternoon. And I would say that out of the, um, you know, last year we had um, a, we had four fourth grade classes. There were at least four or five students from each class that took most of the day, long into after lunch. How long is the long comp for grade four? Uh, well, the problem is, is that it's just a writing prompt, so you can take as long as you need, and it's, it's untimed. Typical, I know. I'm just saying, typically, well, how much are they expected to produce? Um, it, it varies. The, there's a rubric, and you can look at the rubric to see, you know, it's not like you have to write four pages to get a four point out on the rubric, but it has to be thorough, it has to reference, you know, it has to have all of these different parts to it. Um, they, they say that you should schedule, um, you know, like an hour and a half in the morning and then take a break and then, or not in the morning, but an hour and a half session, take a break and then come back for the hour and a half. Some students did finish in that amount of time, which is still three hours of writing, um, but but there were several students that took an entire um, day to do this long comp. So you'd say on average they end up producing, what, a one to three page they essay? They get four blank pages. So they get four blank pages. They can um, do their, their um, rough draft um, separate from that, um, but I would say, yeah, it's one to three pages. Is there a long comp portion to park? Or not. Okay. 
Um, which there's if you take shining. a look at the at the um, grade four for park, there's eight sessions total. Again, they range from 60 to 90 minutes. So there's 800 minutes total scheduled, um, but students, again, did not need the total amount of time. Now, this is just for the PBA. We haven't done the end of the year. Um, we're anticipating it to be very similar. Um, the test sessions for the uh, end of year are 75 minutes long for all of the sessions so um, I, you know it remains to be seen and you know one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that the students I asked a few of them what they thought about park and they sort of neither here nor there you know they weren't extra stressed even the fourth graders they didn't say it was harder or easier than the MCAS that they took last year the same thing for um, you know, the third graders thought it was just okay. They were sort of neutral with it. But when you talk to them about some of the practice that they were taking, the, we had practice park tests, and some of the practice questions, they made comments like, they don't just give you the answer. They make you think about it, which was really refreshing when thinking about, you know, a, an, a standardized assessment that, that they're being asked questions that made you think that, that you just didn't get the answer to. So I thought that was something coming from a fourth grader that really was refreshing in terms of the actual content. You know, there's a difference between all of the scheduling, but then what the actual content measures. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting, for lack of a better word, to see how our students do and to see um, what kinds of, um, you know, positive changes we can make when looking at, at you know, this new type of, of test and, and the kinds of questions they're asked. Mm -hmm. So I'll pass it over to Meredith unless you have any other questions. One more quick question. Sure. So they're not, they're not using the long composition as a method for assessing the fourth grade. What do they use in place of that? Do they have short essays? Do they have short, like what? Yes, the way that, um, now I haven't looked much into the end of the year yet. Um, we haven't taken that. That'll come in a couple of weeks. But for the, um, for the PBA, what they had to do was read a selection, answer a few multiple choice questions, and the way that the multiple choice questions were set up is it was a question like, um, you know, what did the person learn by the end of the story, for example. And then the second question that went along was which paragraph gives you this information the best or describes that. And so then they would have to sort of mm -hmm. point back to their evidence for making that decision, which is very different than the MCAS, which was very traditional, um, you know, reading comprehension question, that sort of thing. Are those assessed, or the, those answers assessed in a standardized format, meaning there's one bubble that is correct, or are they allowed short answer to explain their... Uh, one bubble is correct. Although in the math, in the math it's interesting because they also gave you multiple, you could choose like three correct answers for the math. So that was a new kind of thing. So, you know, you could say, pick which of these, out of these four selections, which select all the ones that could be correct. So that was a difference in, in our thought process. But anyway, getting back to the ELA, um, so there were a couple of multiple choice questions and then it would ask something, a reflection, a reflective writing piece about the reading that they read. So for instance, um, you read a story about a, a student who was doing something long ago, write a journal entry that might reflect how that child felt back then or something to that effect. So it was a question that was a real typical reading comprehension question, then a where did you find that information kind of question and then reflection in writing about what you read. So it's a it's a different type of test whereas the long comp in grade four was a completely narrative writing piece or opinion piece but it was something it was a prompt and then you just responded to the prompt. One more question and this is for both of you. When we get these results back will we have an opportunity for individual classroom teachers for example to, to read these results, match the results with the exact students and kind of gauge is this Am I, do I agree with the assessment of this particular student? Do I feel, you know, from what I know of this student's abilities and achievements this year, do I feel like this is falling in line? Are we going to have an opportunity to... Our understanding is yes. That's what we got for MCAS. We were able to not only get just student scores, but we also were able to get which um, specific items they answered correctly, mm -hmm. which strands those items attached to, so it was all broken down. Okay. We're not quite sure exactly what it's going to look like, don't know. Um, right. but the understanding 
understanding is that we will get individual student scores as well as compiled scores for our schools and for the district. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, it'll look similar to MCAS, but we don't know exactly what it's right. going to, the reporting is going to look like. Right. Well, in theory, we're still supposed to get park results this year, this summer, right, in advance of next year, whereas MCAS, we always get them late fall. Yeah, we're not going to get the park um, data probably till November. We used to get MCAS yeah, in the summer, but I think it's going to be November. Mm -hmm. Well, when MCAS was first being given, we got the results in November, right. yeah. and then they realized that they needed to give them to us sooner mm -hmm. because this is the first pilot, you know, d uh, statewide. It may take them longer to do all the scoring because it's the first time they've done it. So we're not really sure when we'll get the results. They're anticipating trying to shorten that field in the I future. Say, I think definitely beyond yeah, definitely. the pilot thing. I thought that was a, one of the Benefits. big selling points of it was that you actually get data that you can use. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, um, as a, that's what we're being told. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're waiting to see what, <coughs> what we actually get. Mm -hmm. This is a, a real learning experience for us, mm -hmm. and I think right. it's a good learning experience right. um, because there are so many questions that we all have, just like you're having about the, the, the uh, results and how it's going to be presented to us and how we're going to be able to use it. So mm -hmm. um, we're learning every step of the way. So everybody was pencil and paper for us yes. this year, yes. right? And if if we look at part next year, if that's what we're told we do, we're, we're feeling confident that we have the capacity to go electronic. Will students have the choice, though, or to no. bend it up? No, no it's the district um, that makes the decisions. And it's a blanket? One it can be by, um, it was by school. By school building. Yeah. By school building, right, depending on your capability. Right. So it could be that one school would do paper-based and one computer-based. Um, you know, what we are trying to do is, is gear up, and I really am confident with um, our tech director's assistance that we will be uh, ready mm -hmm. to take computer-based district-wide, uh, you know, if that's a request from the state to do that. One question about the computer based is that is it then is it involve keyboarding for short answer for like ELA yes. and so Yes. It would, and the the park is designed to be a computer-based right. test. So there's functions on it, like you can highlight a certain word, and it can read to you because it's not, uh, especially in the math section where it's not a reading test. So there's really great accessibility features that are built in that they allow you to build it and build in with a paper pencil. But it's just not as clean not and easy yeah. as when it will be on on computer. Mm -hmm. So it's designed as a computer-based test. So I think that once we are able to to really use that to its fullest capacity, we'll we'll be in. A better position but we as could well. still, if we had students who had difficulty navigating, let's say a keyboard, let's say they have an IEP, we could mm -hmm. make special arrangements mm -hmm. case yes. by case. There are we'll accommodations. There are accommodations, just like there were for yep. the yeah. So let's let Ms. Belise give us her presentation, and, and I'm sure you'll have some other questions. So, um, very similar huh. to the elementary, uh, we started out in March with the um, the performance based for ELA. So those are our testing sessions. Um, time wise, same as the elementary. Then in April, we had the math, um, two sections for each grade. So we have four tested grades at Whitebrook. And then next week we get to do um, MCAS science because Park doesn't have a science assessment now, so we're still doing MCAS and that's for grades five and eight, two days each. And then in May, these are our testing dates for the end of the year assessment for Park. Um, the Almost all of them have um, very similar for the grades, five, six. Grade five has one less session for ELA, but the rest of them all have the same amount. I think I have it broken down. Um, oops. Uh, for grade five um, to grade five for MCAS to Park, um, how do I go back? Uh, I'm not a PC back. user, so I don't know how to do that. Um, <coughs> you need to go back? No, I, I got it. So four, there's four sessions for uh, grade five for MCAS, and there's eight sessions for PARC. And really, when you see the doubling, really, of the sessions, it's because, like Superintendent Baldby said, it's the PBA and it's the end of the year. So there's two different testing sessions. I think that for us at Whitebrook, that was for teachers and for some students, kind of the, the thing they talked about most is like when we finished the PBA, they thought, oh, we're done, but we have a whole nother section to do. and we don't know yet like what that information the data is going to look like if it's going to be really different we don't know what the content we're not allowed to look at the test so um, it just seems like if they could combine it into one 
testing session it might be a little bit easier because it, it is a lot of days um, in grade six the same thing four versus nine testing sessions and then grade seven is where we had our long comp previously so that that's a plus not to have that just like in the fourth grade we had the exact same um, type of um, long composition for seventh grade and we had you know probably a third of the students that took the entire day to do it because they could and for middle school and I don't know if it's the same for fourth grade it, it was really our high proficient advanced kids that would take all the time because they would want to check everything over you know many times and make a draft and another draft so it could and if if even if it's six kids in one classroom taking the whole day it really prohibits the teacher from moving forward and so with the park I think it was great to have it timed I think it didn't it didn't like you know prohibit people from moving on it wasn't like MCAS when it's a testing day and then the kids are kind of like done for the day so we just we had it in the morning they were most of it was done by 1030 and then we just went on with our regular day so it really didn't you know prevent us from from going on with instruction all those days and I also think um, especially for middle school that the timed aspect of it is is good preparation for students because the other standardized tests you know PSATs SATs mm -hmm. things that they're gonna have to take in high school are all timed so it's just a, you know it's a good practice for them um, anyone have any questions and just just to clarify Meredith mm -hmm. none of these none of these practice they can bomb every park test from grade 3 up until high school until eventually they get to grade 10 that will be the only high stakes for the test. student, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> for the student. Yeah. yeah. My, my point the is, <laughs> my point is, because it's time. I mean, they have years to kind of adapt to this type of a thing, and it's not going to have an adverse impact on an individual student. No, until but I mean, if 10. if Park is what um, you know the state of Massachusetts decides is going to be our assessment, mm -hmm. then we and in the classroom teachers will be adjusting assessments to accommodate that. I mean, we'll start with um, our own timed assessments throughout the year so that when they get to the park, it's not going to be a big deal that it's timed. I just don't want parents to react negatively to this, feeling like a feeling fearful that my child's true potential isn't going to be allowed to show in 60 minutes, especially for the first several times they sit down to this test, that there really is no adverse impact on that right. individual student. The, par the, parent, the parent feedback that I've gotten so far has been positive about the timing because it doesn't it doesn't Suck take up the up whole, whole day, day. and right. stress them out. Right. Yeah. So that's been a good thing. And the other the other positive um, aspect of Park I like is that they give um, they give their own graphic organizer math reference sheets to everybody. It's not just kids on an IEP that get the special accommodation. That it's available and given to everybody. So um, I like that aspect of it too. Any other questions for Ms. Belize or Ms. Napolitano? Is it, is it your sense, and Amy, I don't know if, if you want to answer this as well, that, that you know, when we read the curriculum that we provide in the elementary and middle schools, it's broader than, than math and ELA. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it your sense that, that, that all courses lead to these? Or, or is it that we're doing other valuable educational things in the schools that aren't showing up here and how I mean, I know I it's a broader it's question. It's so I guess it's first probably mixed, but um, definitely in math and ELA, where we've moved at the middle school to um, align with the Common Core. I think, from what I could see with the practice part, it's um, it's a much better assessment t of what we're doing all school year than the MCAS was. Mm -hmm. And I also think we try really hard to integrate science and social studies throughout our ELA and our math. Mm -hmm. Um, curriculum so that there's not that division of okay now it's science time now it's social studies right. time now it's ELA time that it's really <coughs> woven together so you get um, social studies content within the framework of an ELA writing assignment or you get science experiments through the context of a math problem so that we really try to weave them together and I think that we'll see more of that showing up in park so that they're not necessarily um, testing the, the content of science or social studies on the park, but that some of those aspects might appear through the things mm -hmm. that the students read in the, the, the um, park assessment. Very similar to the way that we're trying to do replicate in classrooms. 
Were you able, were you, they had granted access to review the test, like you've seen every page of the test that the students mm -hmm. took, what are you no, allowed to see? No, we're not allowed to, allowed to see anything. anything. There's only practice, practice We've tests. only looked at the practice test and we, we didn't, I don't, I think you're the same, we didn't give the practice test to the teachers till like a month before it. Um, so the kids had a little bit of practice, but that's all we've seen. We're not, we aren't allowed to look at the test either. Mm -hmm. Even after the students complete the test? No. Will that continue to be the practice going? Is it it's practice? always been the practice with MCAS also. And right. do we know what the reason, what's the, I'm sure there is a rationale whether I'd agree with it or well, not. Well, I think they don't want anything shared. Right. It's, it's a security issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like, well, there's hello, there's yeah. extreme. Yeah. Shared with whom? Yes. I'm sorry, with with whom? There's high, high security on students all that have these been taken it? tests. Yes. Mm -hmm. Either park, other park. students that are taking so it, so the or students right. have to. S the students see the test because they take the test. So their right. fear is that the, the faculty and the administration are going to pirate the information. And I don't know, but it's okay. There's also. I'm just trying to illustrate the sure. lunacy behind that rationale. There are there are product. also though. Um, I think legitimately they try out some of the test questions in previous years. Now this is different because it's park, but I know in MCAS a chunk of the MCAS would be mm -hmm. not actually counted for right. that year. But you don't know which but chunk it is. We don't know which chunk it is. So it would be testing out different questions to see how valid they are to be used in future MCAS tests. So it was kind of, there were some of those questions thrown in too, mm -hmm. and they didn't want you looking at those in case they showed up again. Yeah. Right, like, so I understand that we have the hierarchy of companies like Pearson and whatever that develop yeah. these tests. But then we also have the, the root of why we ever started doing this in the first place, which is to gain useful, fruitful data to right. further instruction. Mm -hmm. right. So it seems like it might be a nice, if we're in the beginning stage of this and we have any sort of leverage over companies that are gonna be selling us these products, that perhaps we can argue a case that it would be enormously helpful to allow faculty and staff, even if it's post-testing, yeah. to kind of I see. I mean, with that, that like, if it's, if it's similar to MCAS, um, we did get a lot of information mm -hmm. after. Yeah. They would, re, um, when we would um, sit questions. down and look at our data, they released most of the questions, and the ones they didn't were probably the ones they didn't use and they threw out. Mm -hmm. But when we went through item analysis, we'd be able to get mo almost mm -hmm. all the questions right. eventually. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you're interested in seeing what the park tests look like, the they on the park website um, they do have sample yeah, tests, yeah. which you yeah. can take a look at sort of the format and the, yeah. the way that I mean, it looks. But there that's a good point to uh, also reiterate that on our website, uh, there if you go to for parents, there's a link to park, mm -hmm. and it gives you uh, links to more information on on the park assessments and what the yeah. practice tests look like. I mean, the um, park was even higher like higher security than MCAS. Like the teachers have always, like ad administering the test, have always been able to, you know, be proctors in the room, but they sometimes were correcting papers or, you know, answering an email. Park, like they had to have eyes on circulating the room the whole time. And they had to go around and make sure that each student was like where they should be, but they weren't really supposed to look at the questions while they're doing that. So it was kind of intense for them. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions? Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Let's shut this Yes, down. would you please? Sure. I have one question. Is, isn't it all Pearson all the time? <laughs> it's not companies, plural, is it? Are, are there competing companies, companies that are offering different products to the district? Not to our district, no. Mm -hmm. To the States. Um, states. There are different companies doing a park-like assessment. But Pearson is the one for Massachusetts. Is and answer. for a majority of the other states, is that not? That I don't. I don't know the answer okay. to that. I know there are other vendors. But fourteen states. Fourteen states subscribe They're in specifically. Their consortium, yeah. I think one might have dropped up, but there were fourteen to start with. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you. Now I do think it, it's. It's interesting as a, as a history teacher and as somebody who's a fan of civic education and sees the wonderful work that's done in, in the arts and in other areas, I know that, that sort of the all roads lead to Rome approach is, is in, you know, inspired, I guess is the nicest term, by this form of assessment. I think it's, it's perfectly valid that the educators that, that we still trust to make independent decisions include other kinds of learning activities in our students' experience that don't show up mm -hmm. on, on the test. And so I appreciate that things are in service. I know in the professional development work I've done, you know, 
ELA is where history belongs now. Uh, and I'll confess my bias to thinking, you know, what made ELA more important than history. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not sold on that uh, in terms of what what's being um, learned by students. But I think that there's, and and we know that nationally, there's a lot of pushback now. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how this how this moves moves forward. But there are, there are a lot of wonderful things that our students learn in school that aren't measured mm -hmm. here. I think what I, I um, appreciate about the park assessment over the MCAS assessment, and I think both uh, administrators talked about that, is that it does, um, you know, it does promote critical thinking. So it isn't uh, like the, the MCAS assessment where you went back and found a passage in the, um, the material that you had read and then you just kind of put it back on your paper with a few words around it. There really is uh, this opportunity for and need to think critically, which I think is going to uh, help us spread that across all content areas. I think that happens uh, a lot in history, uh, Peter. You know, and um, so I'm hoping that this will help that happen in every content area, this critical thinking that we really all need to be doing to be successful um, in the 21st century. Any other questions or comments? Okay, ask one more question. Um, I know I've seen an article that Northampton had some issues regarding their parents, I believe, not having some of their kids take the test. Did we have any issues? With we, that. Uh, we had a, a few. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's not actually legal to keep your parent, your children out. Um, that's, uh, you know, they would have to be marked as an unexcused absence. So there is no opt-out function. But we, um, what the, uh, the commissioners sent out a, um, a uh, letter to everyone saying that, you know, if a student came to school and you know was uh, not wanting to take the test that you could you know have the student sit there through the whole period um, and do something else um, uh, and so we had a few students I believe and and maybe uh, um, Meredith I know you had a couple you wanted to speak to what uh, happened we did we had I think we had um, you, you 18 or 19 probably want to go up there I think we had 19 students that didn't take the test. Any of any of the, they're not taking any of the testing, um, and I think parents chose that for different reasons. But uh, they came to school. They said they they weren't taking the test. So we we I we didn't actually have them sit in the classroom. We had all of them in a separate um, empty classroom with a one of our Title One um, literacy coach. Um, did some educational activities with them. So I just thought it would be hard for the kids taking the test to have someone in there just reading their own book. Or, so we didn't. But um, we, then I also had two parents who, who their children took the, um, the ELA ses three sessions, and then they said they weren't taking the math. And I called them on the phone and just said, well, they're halfway through. And th the parents were like, well, you know, OK. And they, they said they could take it. So it wasn't. It wasn't a big deal for some people. I think kids kind of caught on in middle school that, oh, some of my friends aren't taking it, so they talked their parents into it. So it just took a phone call, and that was fine. But there were 19 kids that didn't take the test. Can I, can I speak to this just mm -hmm. briefly? Because I'm really torn on the issue of standardized testing. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not trying to be contrary for the sake mm -hmm. of being contrary, but I think there's, I can sympathize with the parents who feel frustrated and confused and uncertain about the future direction of practices like standardized testing. And I know that Common Core is something in particular that a lot of parents don't feel they understand and they don't trust the longevity because historically what we see is that something, this particular set of standards will be popular and everything that we talk about and everything that we push on our students for a brief period of time and then it's on to the next thing. So I can understand being told that your third or fourth grader will be sitting down for hundreds of hours of testing for something that doesn't actually impact the quality of their education directly. We won't be receiving results until the following school year if their overtaxed teachers have time to review them at length. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to give Park the benefit of the doubt. I'm hoping that in spite of where it comes from that we can make use of it, but I, I, I don't want I don't want to discount the parents that struggle with this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
because I think that that kind of pushback is hopefully what forces these companies to improve their product and to, to help to streamline this process. Just swallowing it continuously and saying, okay, and what's the next and what's the next is never going to help to improve the situation for students either. And I think we heard that discussion. I had mm -hmm. two students who um, refused to take the test at the elementary, and that was it at the entire elementary at Maple included. There was only two. Um, and I, I talked to other parents who initially were thinking about having their child refuse. And I think what part of what happened for some parents is that this idea of opt out got out there and mm -hmm. it was like, oh, I have a choice. Mm -hmm. And right. so when I had the, the conversation with them, no, this is a refusal, like a refusal to take a spelling test on a Friday or a math test on a Tuesday. This is a refusal. I think so I think some of it is is in the way that it was presented to mm -hmm. some parents that they're, oh, there's this option I can opt out. Well, not really. This is what we're doing. It's state mandated, so it's a refusal. And so that changed, I think, some parents parents' minds and, and, you know, just the reality of, of what we're doing. And then I think there's there's a few parents, or some parents, maybe a bunch of parents that have this same question about, you know, is this really what I want my child to be spending time doing? Um, and I think that when you look at um, whether it's PARC or MCAS, there's going to be standardized testing, I think, that, that time has shown that. And there's going to be state standards. I think we've seen that. You know, we've had standards for a good amount of time. So it's what, like you said, what do we do with this information to make improvements to our students' day-to-day -day curriculum and what they're learning in school? And can these tests reflect what they are learning in school? So I think that it does raise a bunch of questions. And I think we do have to give it the benefit of the doubt to some extent because it is brand new. And, mm -hmm. you know, so say, well, let's see what the results show us and see what, how we can use that information to, to make changes to our curriculum. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that those are the kinds of things yeah. that, um, you but know, was There was a lot of bad information out there, uh, there especially was. online. And after that, um, I, did, I had a parent information night where a lot of parents came to ask questions and that that was great because people did they were confused they had misinformation and I think they had a better understanding after that and most of the parents there ended up having their child there was two parents there that they didn't want their eighth grader to take it but their eighth grader said no I am taking it because they don't want to be singled out and it you know we kept it low-key this year it, the, the, the kids knew that it was a no harm year which I think helped with anxiety um, hopefully it you know they, they tried hard on it because like <laughs> Amy said we don't know if they completed it with time left was a good thing or a bad thing but it um, the, the kid the students seem to be fine with it mm -hmm. I mean they're used to taking assessments it's if we you know it's kind of the way we approach it it's it's another assessment I again yeah, I would just like to continue that when, when parents have when there's a pushback I would prefer to as we did with this we approach it with information if this Absolutely. is legitimate and we Absolutely. can stand behind it then mm -hmm. we should be able to sit a room full of people down and explain Absolutely. why mm -hmm. and maybe not every single to the person will understand but that's the best foot forward rather than scaring them and say you know if it's there is no opt-out the other you know and the terror tactics or if, I think it's just much more useful to say here's the inf here's the best information we have and this is why we're standing right and I know the course. state I know I think they're holding their first one at Fitchburg State next week but um, the person that I spoke to um, at the Department of Ed said that uh, throughout the summer they're going to have four or five public forums across the state for um, parents students educators administrators to come and ask questions mm -hmm. and have discussions around it and which, around common core right, I think that's I the think, root mm -hmm. of the fear and the misunderstanding now with MCAS, if a student did not take the test, uh, a score of zero was added into the mm -hmm. school's mm -hmm. report. Right. So it's a definitely a negative impact mm -hmm. on the school's results. Right. Um, I'm assuming that would probably be the same once we're well, out of this I mean, no you, stakes what zone. What they do is you have it's you have to have a certain percent of your students taking the exam. I think it's 95 percent. So we were right, we, we made the 95 percent, but we were like getting close. So if we had not had 95 percent of the students taking the assessment and we happened to have done well, we wouldn't have been able to count it as count. something good. Mm -hmm just important for people to understand. Absolutely, and that's yeah. like like what you said, um, it's, it, this will require a lot more um, parent information sessions, um, you know, in the fall as soon as a decision's made about it because, you know, knowledge is power and I think, mm -hmm. I think that's the way to go. I do think they're right about that. We draw the line. I don't want to start assessing art and music and PE and say and more and more and more and more. And more. Some is useful, mm -hmm. but they're, you know, I think being watchful and, and having them feel like the committee is aware of it and 
you know, mm -hmm. that's important too. Instruction. Like we do, we do assess those subjects, important. and even um, even PE and art or health um, will get involved in um, in looking at what the park assessment looks like and take a little piece of it mm -hmm. and and make you know make that part of their practice. But you know, it's just not as obvious. But it's you know, it, it's kind of all part of the big picture. Right. When you guys, when we look at fall and you guys head into having like parent information mm -hmm. nights, that's where. I mean, that's where I think the meat of everything is. It's all about Absolutely. those relationships. Mm -hmm. So um, not to add one more thing to your schedule, and I'm sure it's on the website and stuff, but could you, is there any way we could just get it as a collective body so that we can get it out on our various social media platforms and stuff too? Because I, I think that stuff goes a long ways. Absolutely. And I even, I don't have a middle schooler, and I would love to attend that. I mean, yeah, I think no, there's, that would just, be, I think that would there's be great. value in that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to our matters for action. We have some minutes to approve. Um, motion to, well, can I? Because you I'm not here. here. Right. Motion to approve the school committee minutes for the April 14th, 2015 session. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And also, Abstain. Peter. And, <coughs> and motion um, to approve the uh, minutes for the school committee work session on April 14th. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Oh. Abstentions. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Very much. and payroll. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve the school payroll dated April 30th, 2015, in the amount of $445,754.05. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Uh, motion to approve the accounts payable authorization for payment dated April 30th, 2015, in the amount of $507,098.71. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That is it. That's it. And we have an out of state field trip request. Motion to approve the field trip request to Mystic Aquarium to the White Buck Middle School students. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye.